All right, our first concept in unit six. Unit six is on equilibrium. And equilibrium is looking at reactions that are reversible. Now, unit six, this is going to be a fairly difficult unit. It covers three chapters in your textbook. It covers chapters 15, which is on gas phase equilibrium, which we're going to cover here in the first week and a half. It covers chapter 16, which is acid base equilibrium. And it also covers chapter 17, which is on buffers and um, saturated solutions and their equilibriums. So that's a lot of concepts all with equilibrium. This year, I'm going to pull out the key points of each. I'm not even going to talk about buffers. I will have a video on buffers for those that are planning to take the national exam. But for those of you that are electing not to take the national exam or um, are just taking the class for credit, um, you can bypass that because I'm not going to have buffers on this exam for this year. Okay, I'm also going to put all three chapters together and test it just once versus in a typical year, I split this and test it twice. So we're just going to have one exam here, um, and this will happen right before spring break. All right, Chapter 15, Gas Phase Equilibrium. So we are going to specifically look at gaseous reactions and reactions that involve gases. But first of all, what is equilibrium? Equilibrium is in a reversible reaction. And now what we're going to see with a reversible reaction is we're going to see a double-sided arrow where the products can actually collide and form reactants. And so there is now a back and forth to these reactions. Not all equations are reversible. For example, if I detonate a bomb, it doesn't get put back together to get as a bomb, okay? So in a reversible reaction, when the forward rate of the reaction and the reverse of the rate of the reaction become equal, just as much product is being made as being consumed as the reactants are being consumed and produced as well. And therefore, what happens when these rates are equal, the concentrations of all the substances reach a constant. So a great way of looking at this is looking again at our normal concentration, which is usually given in molar. Actually, for this class, it's always molar. When I graph the molar concentration versus time, I can get these two scenarios. Now, in this first graph on the left, we are only starting with reactants. So if I look at this reaction up here, I put hydrogen and nitrogen gas in a vessel, and therefore you can see I'm starting at a concentration above zero. The product is literally starting at zero. We have no ammonia and H3 in the vessel. We have only the reactants. So the reactants are bouncing around in the vessel, and some of them collide successfully and produce products. So initially, in this first reaction, there, the forward rate of the reaction is much, much greater than the reverse rate because the reverse rate effectively is zero initially because there are no NH3 molecules to collide with one another to produce the reactants back. So what's going to happen is the reaction is going to proceed forward like in typical irreversible reaction, and the concentrations are going to drop for the reactants because they're going to be consumed, and the product is going to go up. But as the product starts to be formed, now some of the ammonia can start to collide with itself and successfully collide to produce reactants back again. So what's going to start to happen after a given amount of time the forward rate of reaction is going to start to slow down. As we can see that the slopes of these lines are starting to shallow out. And the reverse rate of the reaction is going to start to speed up. Eventually, the two become equal to each other. And when the forward rate is equal to the reverse rate, now the concentrations of the substances stay flat because they're a constant. Now, the reaction is still dynamic. We still have forward reaction, reverse reaction occurring. It's like nothing, it's because it looks like the concentrations are not changing, nothing's happening, but that's farther from the truth. There's a constant formation of products and reactants that they just so happen to be at the same amount. So equilibrium is achieved right here once the lines all flatten out and plateau and their concentrations are constant. Here, on the opposite side, because the reactions are reversible, here's a situation where now we start with only product, NH3, and we have zero reactants. And as you can see, once equilibrium is established here, 
Okay, now initially the reverse reaction is the only one that can take off because it's the only one that has any substance in the vessel. And so there is no forward reaction at first. But eventually the forward reaction picks up as more and more of it's produced and the reverse slows down. And again, eventually reach equilibrium. And if I look at these colored lines and compare them, it doesn't matter if I start with just products or reactants or some amount of reactants and products together, I'm going to reach the same concentrations of the reactants and the products. And this value is called the equilibrium constant. Okay, so that's a conceptual view of what's happening. So down here we have a reaction of A plus B producing C and D. The little A's and B's and C's and D's, those are the coefficients. We can write what's called the equilibrium constant expression. On the national exam, this is typically one of the first questions asked on an equilibrium FRQ. They want you to write the expression. They're not asking you to calculate it. They're asking the expression. The expression literally, as you can see here, is we put the products on top and we put them in brackets to indicate that that is the molar concentration. Kc, as you can see here down here, is the equilibrium constant which involves the concentration of the substances, just like up here. What are these concentrations once equilibrium is achieved? So the concentration of each of the products goes on top and they're raised to their coefficient powers. These are not orders like in rate laws. This is actually the coefficients. Divide it by the reactants, molar concentrations raised to their coefficients. If I actually know what those concentrations are, I can plug them in, and then I can calculate what the value of the equilibrium constant is, and that might be the second part. So in part A in the problem, you might be asked to write the expression. In part B, you then might be asked to calculate what that actual value is, okay? And that's a typical pattern in a lot of equilibrium FRQs. If you have an, a gaseous reaction, you could also be asked to write the equilibrium constant, but involving partial pressures, which is called the Kp. But we can only plug gases into a Kp expression, okay? So if it's a gaseous reaction, we could calculate the Kp, which is the equilibrium constant utilizing partial pressures. Again, how you write this, both of these equations that I've done for you right here are on the green sheet. If you look up the equilibrium section, they will give you the equation as i written up here, A plus B, A big A plus B big B, and they'll also show you how to write a Kp and Kc from it. If it's a Kp, you put parentheses around it, put big P, which stands for partial pressure, and then you label the P with what that substance is, put it in parentheses and raise it to its coefficients. And that's how you write a Kp expression. All right, so let's do the first one together. So down here, write the equilibrium constant expression Kc. All right, so Kc is equal to, we put products on top, so we always have the reaction go the way that is written. So the products are on the right side. And again, I could flip the reaction here around where the NO2 would be a reactant, but how it is written, NO2 is a product. So I'm gonna put NO2, and I'm gonna raise it to the four, H2O, to the sixth, divided by NH3, brackets to the four, and O2 to the seventh. And that is how, if you're asked to write an expression, that's what you do. You put the formulas of the products raised to their coefficients over the reactants raised to their coefficients as well. We don't use A's and B's and C's. That just gives you the general framework whatever the actual reaction is, and make sure that's what you plug in. Okay, go ahead now and do two, three, and four. I'm gonna pause the lecture. When you restart it, you will see the answers to each of these. All right, so you can see the values here for each of them. Again, we put products on top, make sure you have brackets, and you put the powers, uh, the coefficients are the powers on each of the substances. Okay, all right, moving on. On the next page now, at the very top, now I would like you to go ahead and do the Kp for each of the following reactions. I'm gonna pause the lecture now for you to go ahead and do that. If you need to, flip to the previous page and relook at how to write a Kp expression. 
All right, to do KPs, we use parentheses, not brackets, because it's not a molar concentration. It's a partial pressure. Make sure it's capital P, and then the subscripts are what the formulas of the products and reactants are. Again, products go on top, reactants go on the bottom, and we raise them to the power if they have any coefficients. Nitrogen has a 1 in front of it, so does hydrogen and fluorine. So we could put 1s here, but we don't have to because it's an automatically assumed power of 1. So I would recommend not putting it there, but you can. It's not going to be marked wrong. Okay? Is the value of Kc the same as Kp? It can be, but very rarely. There is this equation here on how to convert a Kc, a molar concentration, at equilibrium into what the Kp would be converting those molar concentrations into partial pressures. And you can see here, we take the Kc, we multiply it by R, which is the ideal gas constant, okay? And the value of R that we are going to use is 0 0.0821. We're going to utilize the atmospheric value because usually the pressure used is going to be in atmospheres. The T is the absolute temperature, so make sure it's in Kelvin. And delta N is the change in moles of gas. So we're looking at how many moles of gas there's a change of, and that is what the RT value is raised to. Okay? So right here it says calculate Kp. The Kc at the given conditions is 9.6 at 300 degrees. What would the Kp for this reaction be at this temperature? So this becomes simply plug and shove. So I bumped the wrong button, my bad. So Kp would be equal to 9.6 times 0 0.0821 times, I'm going to take my calculator, 273 plus 300. i got to make sure the temperature is in Kelvin. So it's going to be 573. And I'm going to raise that to delta N. Delta N is the change in moles. So you can see here we have 2 moles of gas minus the reactants of 1 plus 3, or 4 moles of gas. We have 2 minus 4, which equals negative 2. Based on this reaction, going to the right, we have decreased by 2 moles of gas. We've gone from 4 moles down to 2 moles. So this is going to be raised to a negative 2 power. So now we just simply have to punch that into our calculator and convert the Kc value into the Kp. So let's go ahead and do that. 9.6 times parentheses. 0 0.0821 times 573 raised to the negative 2 power. And we get a value of 0 0.00434. So that would be the value of Kp being converted from Kc. All right, go ahead now, pause the lecture, and try to calculate the next one. All right, in this problem, we are given the Kp, and you're asked to solve for the Kc. So I plugged in the values here, the Kp, and then the Kc times 0 0.0821 times 298. The temperature is at 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin, raised to the negative 1. We're going from 3 moles of gas on the left to 2 moles of gas on the right, so 2 minus 3. We are decreasing by negative, by negative 1 moles. So plugging in, solving for Kc, you should have gotten a value of 46,500, okay? All right, a couple other things with K. Units on K. K has no units. It's simply a numerical value which tells us which side of the equilibrium is favored. There are no units on big K. Unlike little K with the rate constant, which has very important units for big K, it is a number that just tells us which side of the equilibrium is favored. Okay, so if you have a K that's really, really big, if K is much, much bigger than 1, if you think about it, the value of K has the products on top raised to their powers over the reactants on the bottom raised to their powers. So if we have a very big K greater than 1, that tells me that the product concentration or partial pressure is much greater than the reactant. So that would tell me that the reaction favors a high amount of products. 
more products are present at equilibrium than reactants. Vice versa, if K is really small, reactants are favored if it's much less than one, okay? K can never be negative because you can't have a negative concentration. It's going to be either bigger than one or less than one. When I say less than one, we're talking about times 10 to the negative power. So the smaller and smaller K is, the less and less product formation is favored. So there isn't a lot of product formation if K is really small. If K is really big, there's a lot of product formation based on how the reaction is written. If K equals one, there's a decent amount of each, but what doesn't have to be the case is if K is equal to one, that doesn't mean the amount of products and reactants are the same. It can, if when we do the value, we get the same coefficients and the same number of reactants and products. It's more so what this number is of products multiplied and raised their coefficients. That number is the same as the bottom number, and if there's different amounts of reactants and products, they can all have different quantities. But if K is close to one, that tells me we have a decent amount of both reactants and products at equilibrium, okay? All right, so here's an example. They give me a reaction and they tell me the KC value. Based on that, how many products would form in the container based on the value of KC? What do you guys think? KC is extremely small. Much, 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 much smaller than one. Negative 30. This tells me that there are very, very few products that are formed in the vessel. Almost all the products are going to be reactants in order to have a K that it's that small. Very few products will be formed. There will be a few, but not a lot. All right, so some other variables with K. When the reaction is reversed, now my products have become the reactants. And therefore, with my expression, now the products are on the bottom and the reactants are on top. What is it going to do to the K value? Well, if I flip a reaction, the K now will be the inverse of the old K value because now the products and reactants will flip-flop. So it's going to be the inverse of the value. Now, this is very different than enthalpy delta H. If the enthalpy was plus 20 going forward, if I flipped the reaction, it would have a negative value in the opposite direction. It'd be endothermic one way, exothermic the other. But this is not enthalpy, this is the equilibrium constant. So K isn't simply become the negative value, which is the misconception for students. K ends up being the inverse, and on your calculator, there should be a key that's X negative one. You simply take the number and raise it to the negative one power, in essence, you put the products and reactants and change their positions, and we get the new value. So for example here, if I flip the reaction compared to what it was up above, okay, what would the value of Kc be? Well, all I really need to do is take the value of it and take it to the inverse 1 power in my calculator. If you do that, we get a value of 1 times 10 to the 30th. Another example of this, if Kc would equal 2, and I were to flip the reaction, the reverse reaction would be 2 to the negative 1, which ends up becoming 0.5. Okay, so it isn't always where we just change the sign. This just happens to be the case because it's 1 times 10 to the something. But you just still have to take the numerical value of the K, raise it to the negative 1 power, and this would be the value of K for the reverse reaction. Okay? If you multiply a reaction by a coefficient, if you double the reaction, for example, if we double the reaction, enthalpy, we would double it as well. K is different. With K, if I double it, I take the K value now and I raise it to that coefficient power. So if I double a reaction, I now have to kick that original K value 
and I have to now square it. I don't times it by 2, I raise it to the coefficient of that power. Okay. Again, everything with enthalpy now is going to be different with K. We have to try to keep that straight. All right, the last thing with K is if two or more steps add up to the overall net reaction, what is the K value for that? So here, if I add these two reactions together, we'll notice the oxygen cancels out because there's one on left and right, and we get the overall equ equation. If I know the K value for each of the subsequent steps that add to an overall equation, the new K value is simply the product of those K values. Enthalpy, we would add the values to get the final answer. Here, we multiply. So as I said, you might want to create a little table of the differences between enthalpy and the equilibrium constant. Because in all these situations that we had with that, it is now a different process. Okay? All right, so now let's apply this. Your job is to get these two equations right here. You need to get them to summate. You need to get these equations to summate to the underlying equation that I gave. And if you have to flip equation or double equation, you then have to properly make the changes to the K and get the overall K value. So pause the lecture now and see if you can figure out this value. I apologize, my microphone was off for a second. As you can see here, the KC ends up being 0.122. If you did that, you got the correct answer. We had to times the first reaction by 2, and we can see that because HF was only present in the top equation, and we needed to multiply that by 2 in order to get the 2 in front of the HF of the overall equation. And then the second equation, you should notice that the oxalic acid was on the product side, but it was on the reactant side, so we had to flip it. So the top reaction, because we had to double it, we have to square the number of it, and therefore it became 4.6 to the negative seventh. The second reaction, we had to flip it, which means it doesn't become negative. K is never negative, but we had to flip it and therefore do the inverse of the K value. And we get 2.6 to the fifth. And then lastly, we take those two numbers and we multiply them because now they summate to the overall equation and we get a KC value of the overall equation given as 0.122. So that's how we can utilize different um, manipulations of K to figure out the K expression for a totally different reaction using individual steps that add up or summate to the overall equation. One last note with equilibrium for this first lecture. If there's heterogeneous equilibrium, which means there's reactions that have different states or same states. Okay, a, homo state, a homogeneous equilibria would be where we have e all the states of the materials are the same. They're all gases. They're all aqueous ions. Heterogeneous means we have different combinations of them. Okay? One note. We, this is a key thing to note down and record down in your notes. We never include solids or liquids into any KC or KP. We never include solids or liquids because as their amounts are changing, so is their volumes. So their overall concentrations are staying constant, even as more or less of them is being produced or consumed. We only include state substances that are gases or aqueous substances in writing a K expression and calculating a K value. We never include solids and liquids. So real quickly, go ahead, and you can see here as our example, calcium carbonate decomposed into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. The first two substances are solids. Carbon dioxide is the only gas. So the KC for this reaction, if it's a KC, we would simply just have the concentration of carbon dioxide 
to the first power. That's it. It's a product, so it's in the numerator. The denominator literally has nothing. In essence, it's over 1. But we don't include calcium oxide or calcium carbonate because they are solid state materials. The Kp for the same expression would be the partial pressure of CO2. Again, raised to the first power. And again, we don't have to put the 1 there because it's the only gas. We never include solids or liquids into the K expression. Okay? All right. Any questions? If there's any questions, please get a hold of me. Um, I think you don't necessarily have to worry about it, but in this first expression here, we would not include water in the expression. In the second one, we would not include those two in writing the K expression, and so on and so forth. So forth. Anything that's labeled with an L or S would not be part of the K expression, either KC or KP. Okay? And that is our introductory lesson when it comes to the, the equilibrium constant and equilibrium. And the homework now is going to be some practice problems out of your online textbook that you can do. And a lot of them will be multiple choice or conceptual pictures that I think are very useful in being able to start to formulate this concept at a higher and deeper understanding. Again, thanks for listening.